வணக்கம் ஹலோ ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வி ஹாவ் பீன் சீயிங் ஹவு தி ஆரியன் மைக்ரேஷன் இன் டு த சப் காண்டினென்ட் ஹேப்பன்ட் இன் வேவ்ஸ் ஓவர் அ பீரியட் ஆஃப் டைம் பை ஐடென்டிஃபைங் தெம் வித் தி டிஃப்ரெண்ட் பாட்டரி கல்ச்சர்ஸ் தஸ் த சிமெட்ரி ஹெச் கல்ச்சர் டேட்டட் டு பிட்வீன் தௌசண்ட் நைன் ஹண்ட்ரட் அண்ட் தௌசண்ட் த்ரீ ஹண்ட்ரட் பிசிஇ லொக்கேட்டட் இன் த பஞ்சாப் பிட்வீன் தி சக்லஜ் அண்ட் த யமுனா ரிவர்ஸ் this was the first wave of the aryan migration a second wave followed between 1700 and 1400 bce which are identified with the gandhara grave culture in the north and the ochre color pottery the ocp culture also known as the bronze age culture extending from eastern punjab to northeastern rajasthan and western uttar pradesh these cultures overlapped with the symmetry h culture and together formed the foundation of vedic civilization the first home of rigvedic aryans the bharata varsha was the land situated between the satluj and yamuna doab doab referring to the land between two rivers and we saw how the rigveda recorded the battle of the 10 tribes Amat Thum the only historical figure was King Sudas of the Barada tribe and how in this battle the Baradas clan defeated their western neighbors the Purus and merged to form the Kurus the Kuru clan emerged as one of the most powerful clans that helped stabilize the Vedic culture the Kurus ended up controlling the lands between the Ravi and Yamuna which came to be known as Kurukshetra and on the banks of the yamuna in mathura there settled the tribes of the yadavas the middle vedic age between 1000 bce and 600 bce saw the aryans shift eastwards towards the gangetic plain the pan indian black and red ware pottery is replaced by the painted grey ware pottery along this trajectory and further down the ganga comes the kingdom of vatsa with its capital located at kausambi Now Hastinapura and Kausambi being some of the old cities which have been excavated by archaeologists these cities have been found to be integrated later into the Mahabharata the painted grey ware pottery culture was succeeded by the northern black polished ware known as the NBPW culture dated to between 1200 and 700 BCE with sites in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar one of the earliest sites discovered by archaeologists on the banks of the river sarayu was ayodhya the aryans spread further eastwards and set up the kingdom of kosala to the east of the ganga yamuna doab and this emerged as a kingdom of some importance though literature of that period completely ignores the presence of the great king rama or his father dasaratha maybe they were chieftains who ruled around that period whose exploits were remembered by bards and carried over the next generations through memories later recorded again in epic proportions in the ramayana which itself is believed to have been compiled around the first century common era remember we saw about the mitanni dynasty that ruled around the turn of the first millennium bce in the mediterranean and we saw of the king dasaratha ruling from his capital vasukani and how in akkadian script on a clay tablet is found a pact that was entered into by these mitanni kings with the vedic gods indra mitra and the narsatiya the ashwin twins as witnesses well were such cross cultural references also linked through carried forward memories there was a king janaka who ruled from the kingdom of vaideha a historic personage who is mentioned in contemporary literature as one who patronized hermits and wandering philosophers who propagated new mystical doctrines and who himself participated in many of these discussions a real historic personage janaka is made the father-in-law of the avatar king rama South of Videha was the kingdom of Magadha then of little account a band of nomadic sort of renegade Aryans who didn't follow Vedic rites known as the Vridhyas roamed the lands to the east of Magadha was the small kingdom of Anga now the name should ring a bell it is portrayed as the kingdom of prince Karna in the Mahabharata 
Beyond that, regions of today's Assam and Bengal were well outside Aryan influence. The NDPW culture has been identified as a very important urban culture of the subcontinent, which is categorized as the late Vedic period and it peaked between 500 and 300 BCE, coinciding with the emergence of the 16 Mahajanapadas in North India. The Mahajanapadas, Maha meaning great in Sanskrit and Janapada meaning the foothold of a people, were a group of 16 kingdoms or rather oligarchic republics that existed between the 6th century and 4th century BCE and this period is often regarded as a major turning point in the history of the subcontinent as it was during this period that the first big urban centers emerged after the decline of the Indus Valley civilization almost 1000 years later. It was also during this period that the Shramana movement consisting of the Buddhism and Jainism faiths evolved and challenged the orthodoxy of the Vedic religion. Born in Lumbini in today's Nepal in the middle of the first millennium BCE, Gautama Buddha belonged to the wealthy Sakya clan, a small autonomous republic at the foothills of the Himalayas. Some of the states in North India were kingdoms at that time and some of them were republics, meaning that Gautama Buddha was not actually a prince but the son of an elected chieftain of a clan. The Sakyan Republic was however under the suzerain of the powerful kingdom to its south, that of Kosala. By the end of 600 BCE, Aryans had migrated further south into the regions of Marwa along the Chambal River. This region was then known as Avanti and then they reached the banks of the river Narmada and yet another important city here was that of Mahishmati. All these regions were colonized by the Aryans while the power of the native clans and chieftains were gradually reduced. This period saw a great development of the sacrificial cult of the ascending priesthood on par with rising royal pretensions. Royal sacrifices like the Rajasuya Yaga, a royal consecration not mentioned in the Rig Veda, was found mentioned in the Brahmanas. And of all the royal yagas, the greatest was the Ashwamedha Yaga, the horse sacrifice, where a consecrated horse was left to roam free on the lands of neighboring kingdoms, followed by a band of soldiers. Chieftains or kings whose territories the horse went into had to pay homage to the king who was performing the yaga or fight him in war. If at the end of a year the horse remained uncaptured, it was brought back and sacrificed. It is quite interesting to note that a cult of horse sacrifice similar to this was prevalent in old Europe extending as far as in Ireland and I will leave the link of a relevant YouTube in the description box which explains this history. The evil effects of such practices that stoked the ambition of kings and their thirst for growing power created a sense of distrust among neighboring rulers and ended in bloody wars. And by this time, the fourfold Varna system was well entrenched into society and the Brahmin priests who were at the helm arrogated more power to themselves. They encouraged the bloody animal sacrifices and suppressed the masses, the sudras, in the name of religion. The rise of the so-called heretic faiths of Buddhism and Jainism could have been in direct retaliation to these practices. From the 6th century onwards, a more authentic and reliable source of history is found in the Buddhist and Jainist scriptures of the period that were composed independently in Prakrit and Pali languages. They contain authentic reminiscences of historical events. By this time, the late Vedic period, the focus had shifted out of Aryavarda into the four kingdoms towards the east, namely Kosala, Magadha, Vatsa and Avanti. Kosala was already on the decline and her king Prasanajit finds fleeting mention in Buddhist scriptures as one who squandered his time and wealth on holy men, both orthodox and heretical. The kingdom became infested with robbers and was loosely controlled by tribal chieftains and vassals. In direct contrast, the kingdom of Magadha emerged strong under the able leadership of King Bimbisara. He ruled from the capital Rajagraha, which was about 60 miles southeast of today's Patna. He married the sister of King Prasanajit, the ruler of Kosala, 
and received in dowry a part of Varanasi which was then under the kingdom of Kosala. Kampa was an important river port from which ships sailed down the Ganges to South India, returning with jewels and spices that were in huge demand in the north. The ships should have sailed all the way down to the Pandian port towns like Korkai. Now, this period overlapped with the age of the Buddha, a period that was not only one of great religious and spiritual ferment, but also a time of great advances in commerce and politics. Bimbisara was deposed, imprisoned and murdered by his son Ajadasatru, who took over the reins in the year 494 BCE, a few years before the death of the Buddha. While in neighbouring Kosale, King Prasannajit was deposed by his son Vridaka. Vridaka attacked and virtually annihilated the clan of the Sakyas, the clan that gave Buddha to the world. But soon, his kingdom was taken over and annexed to the Magadha Empire by King Ajadasatru, who greatly expanded his empire by controlling both the banks of the river Ganges from Varanasi to the borders of Bengal. By the 4th century BCE, Pataliputra, today's Patna, emerged as the capital of the Magadha Empire. And the then King Mahapadmananda succeeded in gaining control over Kalinga, which is today's Orissa, extending to the northern coastal strip of today's Andhra. In 330 BCE, Alexander the Great invaded Persia and having routed the armies there much earlier than anticipated, he marched further into the subcontinent. Though we cannot go into the details here, what is of interest to us is that one of his generals, Seleucus Niketar, sent an ambassador, Megasthenes, to Pataliputra. Megasthenes lived in Pataliputra for some time during the rule of Chandragupta Maurya, who ruled the empire for a long 24 years, ably assisted by the astute Brahmin Chanakya, who is said to have composed the Ardhasastra. Though Megasthenes does not mention this, he gives a detailed account of the rule of Chandragupta Maurya, according to which towards the end, Chandragupta Maurya abdicated his throne to his son Bindusara, became a Jain monk and went all the way to Shravanna Belagola near Mysore and fasted unto death. And in 269 BCE, Emperor Bindusara was succeeded by his son, the greatest and first true emperor of ancient India, Emperor Ashoka. The first true monarch to have left behind written accounts of his period in the famed rock edicts about which we have seen earlier. He describes his change of heart following the Battle of Kalinga, wherein he describes how over 100,000 soldiers died in battle and over 150,000 soldiers were wounded. He embraced Buddhism, abandoned aggressive warfare and even takes great pride in recording how royal hunting expeditions were replaced by pilgrimages to holy sites. He was also probably the first emperor who adopted Ahimsa in a big way, largely reducing the consumption of meat in the palace and completely prohibiting the slaughter of certain animals. It is said his encouragement was in part responsible for the growth of vegetarianism in India. He spread the Buddhist philosophy far and wide, but at the same time preached an inclusive approach to religion, which is seen by how he created artificial caves for the Ajivikas who were a very strong rival creed to that of the Buddhists. He also patronized the Jainas, who claimed that he was a follower of their faith as well. He had antagonized the Vedic Brahmins, albeit unintentionally, as these Brahmins not only lost their power in the king's court, but also in society as people took to Buddhism and Jainism in large numbers. Eventually, after the demise of Emperor Ashoka in the year 232 BCE, the Magadha Empire started to decline. Governors of major provinces who were related to the king declared themselves as independent rulers and the empire went on for another 50 years until about 183 BCE when Pushyamitra Sunga, a Brahmin general of the last ruler of the Magadha dynasty, Brahadrada, murdered him and came to power. The Sunga rulers brought back the Vedic practices, including the Ashwamedha Yaga. Their kingdom was not a closely knit centralized empire as that of the Magadhas, but a type that became the norm across the subcontinent, 
quasi feudal wherever political power enters into alliance with a religion that religion is bound to succeed points out mgs narayanan the noted historian buddhism after the time of its great founder thrived for so long as it had powerful rulers to patronize the moment that support was withdrawn it collapsed this only illustrates the general truth that independent thought among the masses of a society is lacking the masses generally look to the top for leading in such speculative matters as faith and religion and follow blindly he says when the heretic faiths took over the royal courts from the time of the mauryan rule the brahmin priesthood with lack of royal patronage seemed to have migrated southward south of the vindhya into the lands that they considered earlier as unholy and then they crossed into the deccan deccan from terka terka a tamil root word they then came into the tamil country which already had the movendas ruling the cheras the cholas and the pandyas who had already established their kingdoms as found mentioned in emperor ashoka's rock edicts endowed with fair skin and light eyes in stark contrast to the dravidian stock and being scholarly they placed themselves in a superior position right from the time they came they brought with them new rituals accompanied by holy chants that promised more power to the rulers who adhered to them they brought with them a new language samaskritam which literally meant perfected form nandraha seyapattathu and this language of their holy chants was now accorded divine origins they also brought with them the fourfold varna division the brahmins the kshatriyas the vaisyas and the sutras and according to the shastras the kshatriyas could go to the martyrs heaven only if they died in battle and hence the brahmin priests had to invent a substitute ritual to ensure that all the kshatriyas went to heavens and it is said that the priest had to cut the dead body of a kshatriya ruler if he died at home and in order to adhere to their vedic rules that yagnas could be performed by them only for those belonging to the kshatriya caste they started doing what they were best at doing creating myths spinning stories around the lineage of the rulers by mixing fact and fiction that enamored the tamil kings who were by and large of tribal stock they equated the tamil chiefs to the kshatriyas and connected them with aryan puranic heroes through various devices thus the cheras were made descendants of a great ruler who fed all the warriors who participated in the battle of the mahabharata Purana Nuru Song 2 composed by Murinjiyur Mudinaharayar in praise of Seraman Perunjotru Udiyan Seraladan Mantininda Nilanum Nilamendiya Visumbum starts the poem Peruma Alangulai Puravi Aivarodu Sinai Nilandalai Konda Polampoon Tumbai Perunjotru Mihupadam Varayadu Koduthoi O king you belong to the lineage of the great ruler who fed the great armies of both the pandavas and the gauravas who clashed in the epic battle of the mahabharata adukkathu sirudalai navvi perungan maapinai andi andanar arungadan irukkum mutti vilakkittu unjum porkottu imayamum podiyamum pondre ends that song wherein the poet sings people live fearlessly in your kingdom the way the beautiful deers sleep fearlessly where at the foothill of the himalayas in the light of the great sacrificial fires of the brahmin priests the cholas were made into the progeny of the great king sibi who is known for his great sense of self sacrifice for the sake of the dove we cannot go into that famous story here he was supposedly of the lunar dynasty and it is said that the medieval cholas took their name sembian from the name of king sibi identifying themselves with this lineage the pandavas were related to the pandav princes themselves this story spinning became a win win formula for the chieftains were greatly pleased with these associations on the one hand and by granting them the kshatriya status the brahmin priests were now free to perform the yagnas without sullying the shastric rules the brahmin priest then took it to the next level by propagating the idea that the king was a deputy of indra the chief of the devas the all powerful god of the rigveda in all these ways the priests carried the legitimization of these warlords a step further 
and helped their transformation into kings who presided over a political organization. In his paper, The Cult of War, as an important part of class ideology during the Sangam age, the historian M. G. S. Narayanan points out how the Aryan priesthood came in at a very crucial stage in the political and social development of early Sangam age. The services of the priests were welcomed by the chiefs who used it to enhance their own prestige and power. Then occurred a Brahmin chief alliance that went against the peasants and the common people. Why? The priesthood replaced the Parners and then went on to become the king's council and confidant. And the kings rewarded them with Brahmadeyams, land grants that were projected not as an act of the benevolence of the king, but as an act bestowing divine grace upon the ruler. Whole villages were made over to the priests together with the peasants who were tilling the lands. This became an important part of the ideology of the Movenders, whose ascendancy we will explore in the coming episodes. Vanakkam.